Hello, welcome to another episode of Live from the Abyss. This is Doth Nihilus. Um, tonight I have a very special guest. Um, my guest is Nero the Witch. We'll be discussing his uh, or their political, uh, not political, um, spiritual path. And, um, and just, uh, just chatting a little bit. Um, so I'm just going to wait for him, uh, or, or them to come on for our interview. Um, let me go ahead and send him a request. Do, 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 do. Okay. Okay. Um. Okay, um, I am not seeing him. We have, oh, we have one person here. Hello, Caesar Crisp. I'm just waiting for my guest to come on. And... Hello. There we go. Hello, hello. Hello, welcome to the event. Hello. How are you this evening? Doing really well. How about you? I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. Uh, good. Good. I was supposed to have this um, a lot more structured than usual. Um, I, I had decided to sign up to, to go to Houston Pride to be a part of like the marching band with uh, the water committee. So I was like, okay, uh, I'll go ahead and do that. <laughs> so I just jumped on and, and went ahead. Um, but I am having a pretty good day. That's good. I'm, I'm glad you're here. Um, so let me, uh, let me start off by asking you to, to briefly tell us about yourself. Okay. Connection is working. Okay, there we go. Um, my name is Nero. Um, my formal government name is Eugene, but I go by Nero because it's a more formal identification for myself, um, as well as for my name. I do tarot as well as spiritual readings um, and I've been doing so for about at least nine years. Um, I've been formally trained for about four of those years in the nine years that I have trained. Um, so I do know traditional witchcraft as well as hoodoo and doodoo etiquette. Um, I consider myself the magi, um, semi bibliophile of studying different types of magical sex and their systems and the way that they identify their cultural rules and code of ethics, morals, uh, so on and so forth. Um, but yeah. Okay. Well, that's awesome. Um, what got you into paganism? Thank you. One of the things that really got me into paganism, um, it's, a, it's a really funny story, actually. Because um, I really didn't expect it. To, to kind of come out of me. At first, I was more of an atheist. Um, they didn't anything. Um, I, I've had a lot of you know, spiritual experiences as a kid. Um, 
so a lot of what I would undergo um, would just be um, Are you good? It was only when I Are had you there? Um, it's virtual experience um, that my friends actually reached out to me uh, unbeknownst to the problem that I was experiencing um, um, told me to do a spell and it worked really well well I thought, and I started looking for the information to myself, and that trained paganism. I'm still here. Did I cut? Uh oh. Hello? Lost your feed there. Yeah, let's try this. This would be a lot better. Can you hear me now? Okay. So getting in really Are we going to continue without the feet? Entering new stuff. Yeah, I'm still here. I just got here. Um, can you hear me though? Now, right? Okay. <laughs> um, that way, okay. at least, um, until the connection starts getting better, and then. We can start focusing on that more. Uh, um, I was in um, really just getting into the nitty gritty of my spiritual experiences. Um, okay. I didn't really start um, out as more of like a, um, you know, a normal traditional person would start where they would formally get interested and see. I've always had a lot of um, spiritual attacks as a kid or had experiences where I would see dead people or. I would, you know, have things or glimpses or predictions that would just come up for me. So uh, I never really talked about them as a kid, but it still kind of plagued me a lot. Uh, but I had a prominent spiritual experience um, at the age of 16 and started practicing from there um, after my friends kind of dared me to do a spell. Uh, unbeknownst to the problems and things that I was experiencing. Um, what kind of experience did you have? Um, I mean, the normal Catholic experience that most people would have. <laughs> um, it wasn't anything of any prominent significance. Just, you know, I would see stuff and hear stuff and not know how to control it. Okay. Um, so what is the Magi? Am I still coming in clear? So a Magi to me um, really follows the Iridesian past. Um, I, this, is a twine, uh, this is a term that I've coined from my, my practice and my work. Because um, I find that other systems and their way of magic has their own cultural beliefs. But to me, having this type of thing just not only opens up new ways of expressing my eternal like guidance system, I'm not only just moving through each system and learning their ins and outs and reteaching it, um, but also gives me a, a bit of ruling on not to take cultural appropriation to the levels that most traditions would do. Because um, we respect each culture's inherent rules and dictations, as well as how they view their own world through their own lenses, because all of that is important. And that shapes, you know, this iridescent color this lab that people would go through. Um, that gives okay. the color and their spark. So we respect that, but we still acknowledge the systems and how they interplay with one. All right. That's very cool. Um, it's, it's interesting. Uh, Thank you. So you, you said you've uh, done some mediumship. How long has that, has that been uh, uh, focus for you? Um, it's been a focus for me about for two to three years now. Um, only recently because now, you know, my spirit guides and 
to my guidances are around just telling me that this is something I should be more using in depth because I have the gift for it. Um, so when I see people or I hear things or dream of it, I always let people know. Um, it's usually not by consultation as of yet. Um, I'm still trying to get more out there to be more professional with the gift. Um, but that's been around for about at least three years for now. Okay. Um, and you, you, um, how do you, how do you connect with your spirit guides? Um, it could be a form of meditation as usually as first beginners would do, but, um, I've kind of worked out of that. So now I have this like mirroring method that I kind of work with as a technique. I just visualize that they're behind me and whatever image comes to mind, comes to mind. Um, and I describe that to the person that I'm really working with. Um, so I could have like my guide, you know, imagining them just speaking into my ear what they're saying. Um, and they just relay that information, whatever it may have um, to be portrayed to that moment. Um, sometimes I would have my guides come through and tell me something really unrelated. still there um, and I had a dream the other day that I um, someone was cutting their hand on the yeah I, that I you, you kind of broke up a little bit there um, but I Lynn, I, I, you're kind of, I, I put the because, I put the strength of sentences together so um, no no thank you no I'm sorry every now, time it you're, happens like God <laughs> Yeah, um, th this is you know, like I said, you know, you're you're you said you were comfortable uh, d doing it this way, so uh, you know. Yes. You know, whatever, have this whatever's comfortable with you, I'm comfortable with. You know. Um, of course, of course. Um, so, do your uh, spirit guides take any particular no, I'm, forms, I'm sure or do, they, or the do their forms change um, according to the occasion? I would say it's a case by case basis. So they change according to like what form suits them. I mean, as far as their face and their distinguishing features, yes, they would stay the same there. Um, but the clothes that they wear and the presentation of how they show themselves is just like how we as humans vocalize our emotions through the things that we wear. So like if they're angry or they, they want to like come through to verbalize a message, their clothes would match the way that they dress. So sometimes it may be celestial type of wear or it can be everyday type of, you know, human pedestrian clothes that they wear. Um, but the possibilities are endless as to how they want to visualize and form themselves to me. Okay, all right, makes sense. It really does. Thank you. Um, do you worship any deities? Uh, um, that's a tough word for me. Because <laughs> uh, for me, I work with a lot of spirits. Um, but the way that I'm, you know, moving into the unnamed path for my ancestor, ancestors, um, we kind of term the way that worship is akin to, you know, working and standing you know, with your deity to work with them and to also understand that the extent of your relationship is also worked by that extension. So an an act of worship to me is to work in service of my community. So if I work in my service of my community, yeah, that is an act of worship for me. Um, but as far as working with them, I, I say that, you know, I'm in, you know, devotional with them. So that way I can, you know, stand with them more deeply and know that, you know, I'm being respected as, you know, the person that we can rely on together to succeed in our relationship. And I want to make sure that both parties can not only, you know, worship the other, but that we're, we're getting our respected dues, you know. You wouldn't thank Hecate for the work that I've done <laughs> if it was work that I've done. Um, but she helped a part of that work. So the recognition comes to both parties for me. Um, but when I work, at least when I'm in devotional of that, I work, I'm work. devotional to Hecate, and I'm also in devotional to Balan Samadhi, as well as Mimimbri Jeet. Um, 
right now I'm working towards my initiation, um, as I stated before, um, towards the Dark Goddess on the Unnamed Path, um, and I plan to be initiated under that rite. Um, so with that, that's the deities that I am in devotional with. That's nice, moment. nice. And I know a lot of I know a lot of people who get who have really great experiences with that kind of thing. So um, mm -hmm. it's nice to know. You know, it's nice to hear that someone else has a very um, you know profound relationship with with uh, with her as well. Yeah, um, I always say that I have a very very nice and loving relationship with her, um, but I also had a very intense upbringing, uh, which we can get into another time. Because oh okay. my god. <laughs> I will. I, I, I will that, literally. <laughs> I, I assume that's a, a another long, uh, another long story, you know. Yeah. Separate from this. Um, yeah. Uh, how does the um, how does the dark goddess of the unnamed path um, uh, correlate? Uh, um, how does it differ, or how how it might be similar to like uh, Babylon? Um, I would say, um, nil to none, actually. <laughs> um, another thing that they teach us, um, is that each deity that we encounter, um, in likeness of another may do something similar to another deity, but they're not synonymous with each other. So, yeah, Hecate, you know, could always come through as a guise for the, the dark goddess on the unnamed path, but that is not her. You know, we wouldn't say that Hecate is the Dark Goddess on the Unnamed Path because that they're two different individual beings. And, you know, they would refer to state that as <laughs> um, But if, you know, in contextual terms, you know, Babylon and the way that the Dark Goddess, you know, manifests um, is really individualistic. Um, but she, she really does bring a lot of that, like, unearthing um, the foundation and removing what doesn't really serve you and taking into account of like how to really nurture the, the me self, self-preservation of I, um, as far as I would know in the Dark Goddess of the Unnamed Path. Okay, interesting. Um, and I, I would say that uh, Ecclesia of Babylon has a similar, a similar view of how um, all, um, all goddesses are really avatars or aspects of a single divine feminine. Um, so it kind of reminded me of what you were talking about um, in, in relation how how the path looks at the dark god. So I saw some correlations there, which I thought were cool. Well, thank you. Um, I'm glad that did you do. And uh, what kind of magic do you do? <sighs> that list gets long. <laughs> <laughs> That list gets really long. Um, I do crystal magic, um, but I like to term it as Iridesian magic because um, mm. that's a part of the Magi's path, uh, which we can get into later. Um, okay. But I do Iridesian magic as well as um, I do crystal ball, I do dream analysis, I also do hoodoo, as well as um, folklore magic as well. Um, I think the other things that I do is ceremonial. Uh, like I said, the list gets on. Um, <laughs> but those are the ones that I can kind of come up at the top of my head right now. Um, and also ancestor. Okay. Um, um, uh, how, how, how uh, if you don't mind me asking, how, how do you work with your ancestors? Um, it's kind of like a, um, it's, it's a thing that I'm working out. <laughs> I'm just going to call it that. Um, <laughs> Because uh, as of new information of like working through this course for a year with the unnamed path and getting initiated, I'm learning new ways to not only honor my ancestors, but also my key ancestors and how that extends into my venerative practices of how to elevate and, and work them in spirit. Um, so for me, I'm, I'm always setting up an altar and, you know, I burn my incense as well as do my prayers for them every day. Um, and it's worked really well so far. You know, a lot of the practices while I was um, in Oklahoma City, because um, I used to do a lot of group readings there, um, and it, it really helped me out to do the things I wanted to do. Um, I was actually getting evicted um, a part of my time there in Oklahoma City. And um, 
if you haven't read this book uh, by Mallory Van Doyce, um, Ancestor Veneration by Mallory Van Doyce, um, it is very, very good. Um, it's one of the methods that are out of there is that when you're in a state of eviction or a problem with your landlord, you can flip um, all the objects and items and totems on your altar upside down. And you basically indicate to them, you know, when I'm in trouble, you're in trouble. You know, when I'm not being fed, you're not being fed. And this is your problem, and this is also my problem. And what resulted for me was happening was that my landlord's apartment um, burned. <laughs> she, she had a, a house fire that happened oh, wow. literally like a week later. Um, but that only staved off like three days after the eviction notice. So the eviction notice came right after. I was like, damn. <laughs> well, thanks, guys. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry you had to go through that. You know. I mean, it's it's life. It happens. You know. Yeah. In America, so it's not like um, I'm real too sad about it. But you know, I understand that they did what they did, and it, it's helpful and it's nice to affirm that they're there. That's like the biggest experience. That I, I'm glad that you know I still got evicted because you know that's something I could take away of like, okay, we got you. We're still here. Um, also, fuck that bitch. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. We yes. understand. Yes, we know she was evil. Okay, we're going to get her together. <laughs> um, and that made me much more joyous. Um, but it's just one of the things of working with my ancestors is always an evolving and beautiful process. But now when I have my gay ancestors are here and I'm working with them, it's um, a lot more integral. It's more connected to my being. And I see it inspiring new gifts that you know, I haven't touched in a while because, you know, a younger me at the time was like, too scary for daring, um, and are starting to come right back up and, and show me a new way of thinking and looking at them. So um, another thing that I used to do as well is like, um, I used to teach people how to open their gifts and work with them. So that's something that I still do, um, just on a lesser active basis due to some other issues um, that I went through as a learning practitioner. Um, but it's it's one of those moments of like, okay, I learned how to do this. Let's do this. Or let's work in tandem with this. And um, building new solutions with modern problems, with, you know, new everyday gifts that are coming through. Nice. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, Thank you. So um, you said you uh, you do shamanic, shamanic practices. Um, that is correct. That'll, huh? That is correct. Oh, uh, okay. Um, what kind of uh, what kind of shamanic practices do you do? How, how does that what does that look like? Um, I do shamanic practices with the unnamed path. Um, then what that kind of really looks like to me and most of my brothers is just going into the deep and experiencing not only your emotions but also what's in tie with those emotions. Where do they come from? and really just looking back and happening to you in the current moment because it's evading all this other stuff. So like, I look at the shaman as like spiritual maintenance um, and looking at what parts of you are kind of really not running clearly and are running cleanly. Um, Cause you know, we have, you know, modern day blockages that we get and you know we have to and once we you know hit that blockage we're like okay i have to t i have to look and, and ex examine where this is coming from and you know that stifles our practice and you know some of us practice daily such as myself and you know i sometimes have to put myself in a space of like okay i'm tired today why am i tired and peeling that back and reviewing and to practice today or would it be more beneficial to my being to rest and, and take a chill pill today and most times the very answer is you know you're chicken or you know something isn't giving the the spirit of the magic to you in that moment you know you just have to look at what's in your space and what's calling for more magic somewhere else and that can look like self-maintenance self-care or just be angry and allowing yourself to express emotions um, which is another thing that you know the new age stuff kind of really um, negates with toxic positivity just being like well you're in this emotion you got to get out of it or the things that you're manifesting will never come to you when hitting with your emotions and saying that it's okay to be in this space and experience it 
um, will benefit you much more than any other person can tell you. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Um, what is death walking? Um, and how is it similar or different from astral projection? Okay. So, death walking um, is one of the four directions um, that relates to the unnamed path. Um, and one of them is just, you know, walking and acting in service of the community with the dead and to be able to work with the ancestors that have passed on and to be able to commune with them. So they're like your everyday mediums that, you know, um, go into this path work. to do something of service to the community. to experience a loved one um, and just let them know that they're okay. Have. No, oh, I missed it here. Yeah, um, I was, I was, you were breaking up pretty bad, pretty bad there. Um, but I got, I got yes. most of what you were Stop talking about. And I found <laughs> uh, it was very interesting. Um, how, how often do you, uh, um, how, how often do you communicate, commune with, um, um, uh, the debt, I guess? Um, with death walking, <clears throat> It kind of really follows the season. So um, I'm in moments when, you know, I'm really in tap with them and I can, you know, go and, and visit the gay ancestors and, and learn their lessons. And sometimes <laughs> I'm so out of depth that I can't even reach like the first quarter of them. And that's okay. You know, sometimes, like I said, it's, uh, it's important to recognize what's kind of running cleanly and what's not. So I always take time to like, you know, give reference and give elevation. So when I have space for it, I can I can definitely channel them and get them to, to come to me like, hey, let's go and sit in this space and talk for a while. And, you know, as things go on, um, you know, if that becomes a part of the practice, then this will become more like a, a more consistent thing for me um, since it's one of the only areas that we touched upon until, you know, we're getting towards initiation. So a lot of my priorities are elsewhere. <laughs> Um, but talking with them and experiencing them is an amazing feeling, especially in the things that you learn from death. And that's very true. Um, that is very, um, on, in, to any degree, very um, liberating, but also a very uh, uh, very scary. I've had like. Uh, mm -hmm. Many death experiences, you know, like many ego death, mm -hmm. um, and that was very intense experience. Um, yeah, but, yeah. Um, one of the things that I went through as a child. Um, so, like for a lot of people, um, I think I said it before that they got into the path traditionally. Um, for me. You know, I've always been a kid in and out of the hospital, like the one of those kids in the bubble. So, you know, I was in and out of the hospital three to six times out of the year, and that's only on a good year. So I would always be like a hospital kid um, due to my severe asthma. Um, so a lot of my problems and stuff that I first started with were just more about my mortality and death. And, you know, I learned a lot of things that the kids never really got to learn at such a very young age, or when they do is because, you know, a parent has passed or, you know, a relative has passed really, really at the time of their growth. And, you know, they understand that at that very age and level. Um, but for me, I've always was constantly surrounded by death that, you know, it doesn't really phase me when it happens. Um, but everyone else kind of like feels it and moves through it. And as one of those, you know, the impact people, you know, I feel it more closely nature than where it comes from. Um, so I, I find myself in spaces experiencing pseudo symptoms of losing a loved one. Um, but I also know like what needs to happen. And, you know, I facilitate care because, you know, part of my work is to be in service of my community. So 
um, when I work with people and they're experiencing, you know, symptoms of death or things such as that matter, you know, I'm always there to provide, like, what you need. Um, do you need me to cook? Do you need me to just give you a, a few space to just, like, cry and let go? Do you need a hug? you need a hug? What can I do to be of service to you so that way I can help, you know, move you through this process? And that can look like a day of just helping that person out to, like, me being there for a whole month, you know, just... You know, coming through and saying, hey, how are you doing? What's going on? Are you feeling okay today? You know, what do you feel comfortable doing today that's going to help you move? Um, that way we can get some space to allow you to move forward and process. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. That's very beautiful, you know. Um, that you're able to, you're, you're, you're connecting uh, with people on, on different levels and, you know, um, spiritually and um, uh, astrally, I guess. Oh, I'm not sure astrally is the right word. Uh, you've been talking a lot about the unnamed path. So what is the unnamed path? So the unnamed path is a spiritual shamanic tradition for gay men by gay men. But um, since a lot of these mysteries can involve just about, you know, uh, women who love men or even just you know lesbians who women who love women or you know trans people you know female to male male to female um, it's an ever expanding tradition that evolves a lot of the LGBT um, we just haven't had a lot of people come through for those mysteries yet so um, my mysteries on the lesbian or trans mysteries are not mine to tell so I'm ready to come out they'll come out and you know they'll reveal themselves to us in their own spiritual I lose you again. Again? Hey. Yep, I lost you again. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, because my thing went up. Um, that's, but yeah, it's an eclectic tribe of, you know, LGBTQ people, um, of men who love men, women who love women, um, coming together as a tribe to reveal our mystical mysteries and esoteric wisdom. Nice. Hey, that, 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 that's awesome that, um, you know, because, you know, the traditional, uh, not, the, the usual trappings of uh, paganism is, is you know, uh, given this, this binary, um, you know, two, two gender expression, which is very exclusionary, you know. Yeah. And there's a lot of people who take a very hard line um, to that interpretation. And it's awesome to see yeah. a tradition that um, validates people um, regardless of their of their uh, you know, their sexual leaning. Even though it's, you know, ultimately specifically uh, uh, path for LGBTQ plus I, I still think it's uh, beautiful that it, it's so inclusionary, and I think there's a lot of traditions, um, both in occultism and paganism, that could definitely learn um, from their from your guys's example. Are you there? Well, thank you. Um... You know, I've only just recently entered this tradition or entering this tradition as a current. Did, did you hear so everything I as said? Far as my, yes, I did. Um, I oh. was responding, actually. Um, so um, I'm thankful that you guys are open to the presentation of new things. I'm just entering this tradition as of late. So, like, you know, as far as the mysteries go, I don't know too much. But as far as my own queer mysteries and the things that I've learned are part of my craft, um, I like to let people know that we're not going anywhere. We'll always be here in your spaces, in your classrooms, as well as in your doctor's office. And, you know, we have all these mysteries and occult knowledge to share, uh, you know, but um, being that this tradition will grow with me as time goes on, I also know that I'm not as secular as per usual. So you'll always find me in different spaces with different occultist people sharing this knowledge and wisdom because, you know, the whole point of sharing this occult and, you know, mysticism of queer history is because a lot of erasure has gone on, not only for POC people, but as well as for queer lives. 
um, and their story of mysticism, you know, and how they interpret, you know, the spiritual dogma that we also encounter, as well as the heterosexual people that are there too. But I also find that, you know, queer history, as well as POC history is inherently political, um, and my being is political. So I want to understand things about myself and the people that surround me as to why I am this political inherency upon the world. That's awesome. That's really awesome. And and you know, you you know, yes, you are here to stay, and I am more than happy to to provide a space for um, for you and for um, any other person of uh, of marginalized or oppressed you know oppressed groups that need a voice you know. Exactly. Well, I see and recognizing that you're always going to be under attack about something. Something is, is I lost you again. And, you know, adversary to something else. Um, so there's always meant to be this law of chaos or, you know, the law of power that presents itself in different states of position. I talk about in my book um, that I'm writing of Hidden. Um, it's just about these different distinctions of laws that I've, I've magician and the ways of queer history and how that evolves. Um, with that, um, oh, did Jimmy? I wanted to ask. I wanted. Mm -hmm. Huh? Go ahead. Oh, I wanted to ask. Um, how do the um, how do the LGBTQ plus and POC communities influence your practice? You kind of touched on this a little bit with the last question, but I wanted to kind of give it give you opportunity to elaborate a little bit more. Oh, of course, of course. Um. This is in regards of how, oh, you know, POC man, cultures, sorry, my bad, to be able to start stepping into, you know, POC spaces and allow POC people as well as like LGBT communities to be able to, uh, to have more presentation in space in not even in a heteronormative, but also just a regular space is, you know, to put them in positions of power, you know, open up their voices, open up ways to allow their voices to be Because, you know, we're always, you know, benign to be silenced whenever there's an opportunity. So I always tell people it is so important to have, you know, POC people in your space because we let you know a problem is there before you even recognize that it's through the doing things from our perspective and, and what we go through as people. Um, like as of recently, I've had to, you know, check a friend earlier um based on my interactions with them in their server because you know someone was you know i was bringing up a point as to why like you know someone is being really transphobic as well as homophobic in the group and i you know you have no moderators in the space to like tell us like what when are they going to stop doing that and you know he was like well you know if you've been kicked out of every server in every place and, you know, this is just a reaction that's been happening. You should probably be examining your way that you're reacting to something rather than, you know, just checking it out as like a, a moral experience and basically was telling me in layman's terms that it's my fault that, you know, I am this way um, and not hearing my voice. Uh, so I always want to, like, bring attention to, like, why that's problematic and why that's, yeah. like important so i i asked him like I mean, what why did you say that you know why is that something that you thought was okay to say to me when i checked you and a checks and balance of power and you you just basically told me it's my problem even though this is your server and you want to be of leadership you know that's that's disgusting and i want you to recognize how disgusting that was when you said it and this lead to him putting me in a moderator position so i am now a mod of that space 
And if someone comes into the space, you know, being transphobic or homophobic, now I have the position of power to be able to not only tell them why that was transphobic, but also to, you know, put voices that need that, you know, understanding like, hey, that's not right. You can't do that. And really moderate the place that's there. But besides being in a position of power, but to like, like I said, hear their voices, know their names, know their stories, and understand why these mysteries are there in the first place. You know, why does this person operate in the spaces they are? Um, it's part of the reason why I love being around different occultist people because, you know, I'm always down to learn about who that person is, what their story is, why did they come to the craft? Because, you know, you never know who's operating in the same space as you. So it's important to learn just how important that is of being in your community and being of service. You never know who's going to be in your corner. Right, and that was definitely not not a uh, not the right take to 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 have when when being challenged on that. Um, mm-hmm. For the simple fact that um, when someone challenges you and puts you in a in you know puts you in that in you know you know checks you basically, you know mm-hmm. you should you shouldn't uh, have a reactive. Uh, position like that. Instead, I believe that you should look, you know, look at it from an internal perspective and look at it from another, you know, have empathy, look at it from a sympathetic perspective and and understand that that person's voice is being, um, you know, they're being uh, discriminated against. You know, you wouldn't want to, you know, I wouldn't want to be discriminated against you know, any more than the next person, and it's important to elevate, um, elevate everyone, make, you know, make sure everyone's voices are equal within a platform, you know, and that's what I try to do, and that's what other people within my, within my own, uh, tradition try to do as well, you know, make sure everyone's voice is elevated, right, um, of course, the, the, um, the last question, real quick, um, is how can pagan occult spaces improve oh. representation for LGBTQ plus and POC occult and pagan practitioners? Oh, easy. Get involved. <laughs> <laughs> Very easy. Get involved. Become an ally. Talk to us. Learn our, like I said, learn our stories, but also enjoy our holidays with us. We're always more open. Oh, someone's in there. Someone's in there. I'm um, sorry. Um, enjoy our holidays. <laughs> Um, allow us to be able to have space with you and to bring bread with you because then that gives us not only more energy and connection to the people that we're, you know, to get to see the story unfold with us. Give me one. Uh, So, you know, it's important to have that distinction and to know what story needs telling and and what story needs to be known and you know, what things need to not be heard <laughs> in spaces of growth and, and ties to human rights and human connection. You know, because I always tell people, human rights ain't for debate for me, you know, because, you know, for 500 years, we had to deal with human rights debates to, you know, wonder who is a human being, who's not. And I don't want to put anyone in a position where they ever have to question themselves if they are a lesser human or not, especially as a gay man or as a black man or as a trans man or as an Asian person, so on and so forth. You know, your life matters regardless because you're a human. And you deserve to be human just as much as any any one of us on this earth. Exactly, 100%. Totally agree with that. Um, Yeah. I wanted, um, it was a question that was brought to my attention. Um, But I wanted to ask you, uh, what are your thoughts on the recent uh, Supreme Court ruling, real quick? Um, to me, I'm, I'm very frustrated. I'm sitting in anger. You know, as of today, you know, I'm trying to help. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm trying to, you know, open up space and revenue. Um, and what I ever I can allocate to my trans brothers or trans sisters, um, as well as women all over anyone that can't have a uterus because, you know, I'll never experience, you know, one birth or, you know, pains of child labor and stuff like that. And, you know, now basically women as well as maybe trans men or trans women everywhere will have to experience that on a different level. 
and I'm just yeah. trying to understand what advocate of the space and how else can I be of service to my community? Yeah, and, and, um, it, and I, I fear for the future, you know, I mean, this ruling just makes, you know, legalizes uh, chattel slavery, in my opinion. Um, but it also has, it also, you know, it also has serious implications going forward for same-sex marriage, same-sex relationships. Um, you know, the, the Supreme Court wants to get in bed and, and regulate how a person um, it exists, how a person lives, um, how a person loves. Um, yeah. And yeah. I don't see that as being uh, reflective of personal liberty or freedom. Yeah. Um, we as gay people and LGBT people, pride started off as a writer. And that's as much as you really need to know. You know, I always tell people, I know that you can't be an advocate for violence, but I'm going to tell you right now, burn that shit down. <laughs> uh -huh. Burn that shit down to the motherfucking ground until there's nothing left. Because the whole point of us making our voice heard and known is to not test its people. A government that does not hear its people is not a government. It's, it's just the part yeah. of the dictatorship that occurs. And I won't stand for it. If I got to get out there and be a voice, you know, I encourage everyone else out there to be, do the same. Walk out of your house, go where you got to go, and make some motherfucking noise. Shake these change out of these motherfuckers. You know, because they will not hesitate to do it out of you. 100%. Mm -hmm. um, you know. And, and I, you know, I have my own personal views on, on the nature of the state and its function. Um, I'll save that for a different, uh, different occasion. Um, but I, I, I agree with you that, um, people's freedoms are definitely something that are, 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 are you know, we, we each have responsibility, not just for uh, our own freedom, but to protect the freedom of others, you know, uh, great. I, I agree with this quote a lot that um, the, the uh, freedom of all was essentially my freedom, and that um, any that any time a person's rights are trampled, it changes all around. You know, I, I kind of took a couple of different quotes there, but that I agree with. But it, it, you know, it makes um, no, of course. No, I agree with those wholeheartedly um, because it's always so important to recognize that other people are in trouble. You don't have to be a gay man to say, oh, Roe versus Wade is evil. You know, the, right. like right. that the uh, overturning of it is evil. You can stand up right now and say it. It doesn't have to be a moment where we're in a position of trouble to be able to say, oh, someone else is in trouble. Let's help them. You know, it's about the humanity behind it. Just as much as like if somebody needs my help, and I'm right next to them, I will not hesitate. I could be on the road, I could be in the car, I could be on the side of the road watching the way. I will help, because I know how it needs, if someone needs help, I'm gonna help them. Right. You know, because they need help. It's like that, but, uh, mm -hmm. sorry, it's, um, it's like that poem, um, you know, first they came from the communists, and I wasn't a communist, so I didn't, you know, I didn't say anything. And then, you know, and on and on. And then finally they came for me and there was nobody there to uh, advocate for me, you know. Mm -hmm. So we, ha we have to be advocates for each other. At exactly. Least look at it. Yeah, of course. I be an advocate for one another. Recognize what needs need to be celebrated in the moment and what needs to happen. You know, what voices do we have to put in front of the other? Um, and, or in likeness of another, you know, so everyone gets a piece of the pie. Everyone gets hurt and their needs are met. The community is in safety. But right now, a lot of our communities are in jeopardy <clears throat> just so that new things can be instilled. Uh, as of recently, with the Pluto, U.S. having its Pluto return in a moment, 
So I know a lot of shit is shaking up for transformation and death to occur, but I'm not wishing nothing on nobody, but uh, I just know that it's important to stay safe and to follow your guidelines for the appropriate people. If you're going into these groups or going to protest, find your ways around, know your exits, situation awareness, um, but also know that you are protected and you are loved. And no matter what happens, you know, we're always carrying. Just like you got me, I got you. And I definitely share that sentiment. Um, and one thing, your your uh, statement about uh, Saturnian retrograde and stuff reminded me of that with every death, um, comes this might be the beginning of something new. I hope something positive will come from this. Um, even though it's extremely negative and extremely impactful for all the wrong reasons. Yeah. Which is understandable. It's a Satorian thing <laughs> as well. So I understand exactly how that may look to someone else. But I also know that the life that someone lives and the death that happens, their life stays with them. And now we have an algorithm that repeats the statements and sentiments of those who have long passed before us even now. We can see it. And now we can vocalize their very intention, their movement, and their expressions. Um, so now even more people and even more people See you know, I know that long after I pass, if I pass unjustifiably, or if I pass in a way that does not deem myself out of my character, people will have my words to back me up on, to inspire them, to allow them to get angry, to be frustrated, because that's their human right to love. They can do whatever they wish, but I also know it's in the pursuit of their happiness. So, no judgments there. Yeah, do what thou wilt should be the whole of the law. That will be done. Thy kingdom come. Yeah. Um, with that, um, I have we, we have only a little bit left, so I want at, to ask you, where can people find you? You can find me on Instagram as well as on Twitter. Um, um, on Twitter, you can find me at um, Nero the Witch 9, I believe, or actually 369. I'll go from there. And then you can always follow me here on Instagram if you can't find me there, which is Tarot with Nero 9. Um, I think those are the only two places that I'm open on right now. You can also search me up on Facebook. Um, actually, you just look up Nero the Iridesian Witch, and you'll find me there. I also offer services of consultations, for crystal ball reading, for crystal readings, and I also sell some items that you might like, you might not like, whatever may have you, I have it available. But you can always awesome. find me on those presentations of those places. Awesome, awesome. Well, it was great having you on. I hope have you on in the future hopefully on a little bit better circumstances with the with the oh. connection i'm sorry I, I i feel really bad about that um no nah, it's okay but don't don't fault yourself i said <laughs> no nah, it's okay don't fault yourself it was my own doing so like you know i overbooked so i always want to make sure that like next time i have the space to do it um because i was literally supposed to come yesterday but i booked the trip for today because it was like it's already past two o'clock why would i go now <laughs> um, so uh, but i will make sure the next time we'll have a better stable connection that way my face will be present and you can see my mannerisms and everything as i you know walk through this discussion with you <laughs> awesome well anyway if you have a great evening it was it was great talking with you and bless uh, it in 93 bless it be Mary Pete, Mary Mark, and Mary Meet Again. Mary, Mary Meet, and Mary Part, Mary Meet Again. Bye. Bye.